trying to get back to the basics of great products. Power comes from sharing information. I try to convince people to slow down. Free. Yeah. Open. This is the Soak Tyson Podcast. Hello, hello, welcome back to the Soaked by Slush podcast. My name is William von der Palen, and today alone in the studio with the CCO of Spinnova, Lotta Kopra. Welcome. Hi, good to be here. Nice to have you here. Do you want to start off by telling the audience a little bit about Spinnova? Mm. Uh, when did you create the company and what do you do and, and so forth? Uh, yes, absolutely. A pleasure being here. So at Spinova, we aim to revolutionize the textile industry, the way of making, producing textiles. Um, Spinova is a technology that enables the production of textile fiber very sustainably uh, without any harmful chemicals and with very little water. And it's a raw material we can use um, wastes, many types of waste, for example, textile waste like cotton. And then uh, agriculture waste, like wheat straw, and even food waste, like anything from potato peels to cocoa pads and so on. So very exciting. And then we can use a certified wood, like we typically do, do today. Okay, so you can basically create create the material from a lot of different inputs. You don't need to source new new material or, or waste resources in that sense. So it should be pretty much of a closed loop in that sense. Yes. It, and it very, very much is so. So um, unlike what you're used to seeing in this industry, our process has no side streams. And let's not go technical, but but this is very different than than the production of, let's say, Lyocell or something else. Is. Yeah. Okay. So what's the story then behind behind the company? You've uh, it's not you're a startup in that sense. Yeah. You're you're popped up on the map quite recently with your IPO and and some bigger partnerships. But the company is is already. Uh, it's it's seen a few years of operations, right? Mm. Yes, um, it's quite a fascinating story uh, how the company is founded. So, uh, about eleven years back, uh, our co-founder Juha Salmela um, visited a research or, or a lecture series in the Oxford University, and this lecture series about was about how the spider is spinning the spider web. And uh, Juha was the researcher at the VTT at the time, um, researching the uh, rheology, so the science of flows in the context of pulp and paper. And uh, at this uh, lecture, at that day, he got this crazy idea that what if he would combine his rheology knowledge in pulp uh, with um, how he got inspired about the mechanical process happening when the spider is spinning the web and bring those two together uh, uh, with the intention to, to create the textile fiber. Uh, so this is something that nobody else had had uh, questioned before or asked before. And it was very, very revolutionary. He went back uh, to do VTT uh, and made himself a few clumsy early trials. And um, those proved to be quite quite promising already, very early, of course. And then he and the other co-founder, Janne Poranen, uh, dedicated a research team around this topic. And and uh, that was the beginning. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, w- why is this important? W- what is your vision for the company? Why are you doing this uh, in the first place? Yes, uh, we see this opportunity to revolutionize one of the biggest industries in the world. And uh, in a bigger scene, we see now a big uh, disruption in the material space, also in plastics, not only in, in uh, textile materials. And and it's part of this uh, development moving uh, from uh, chemical intensity towards uh, mechanical, even electricity intensity as a bigger sort of phenomena ongoing. And, and, uh, and, and our innovation is can be uh, classified as part of that. But our innovation is, is sort of very, very disruptive. Uh, one of the, uh, many of our investors call it a, a true 10x innovation because it, it enables both a production of a, a very good quality fiber 
uh, in terms of sustainability and product quality and at a lower cost. Yeah, sounds like a good deal if it works. So, um, okay, you you work as a the CCO of the company, and uh, it's um, it's maybe not, or it's it's obviously a common role. There are many CCOs, but it's not something we've uh, talked about on this podcast at least before. So, it would be interesting just to hear what the role of a CCO is in a company like Spinovo, which has a deep tech innovation and is is now entering the market and and trying to to create this solution on a on a bigger scale. Mm. Yeah, to me, it's the most inspiring role ever. So it is uh, first and foremost to create the product market fit. So if there is a great innovation in place, then one needs to validate the demand and the product qualities for for the customer and for the marketplace. And, and that work um, is ongoing and we have already validated uh, the product market fit for many of the application categories that we can we can support now and and then of course that work continues um in order to actually commercialize and scale this up we need to have the product quality in place we need to have the sustainability values in place um, we need to have the scale very important and then the price and those we now for a big share of the market we already have today yeah, so what does it look like day to day? You you talk about product market fit validating. So is it a lot of customer work? Is it how does it differ from from a more traditional, say, head of sales role? Is this something you put in place before actually starting to to sell? This is more of a, as you said, uh, strategic role, validating role, and and then after that you you maybe put a sales team in place or or mm, yeah. Uh, well, companies are, are organized in a, in a different ways. Uh, for us at Spinova, the commercial team looks at uh, sales, partnerships, um, the commercial offering, uh, marketing brand, such things. So um, we built what is the commercial product together with the textile development team and bring it to the market. Yeah. What do you think makes a good good CCO for a, for a deep tech company? What kind of skills for anyone, you know, thinking about getting a CCO for their own company or or some founding team thinking about maybe maybe having that role? What kind of skill sets um, are important to be mm. to be good at that job? Um, hmm, a good question. I should have read the questions prior prior to uh, <laughs> filming, but uh, if I shoot from the hip. Um, I think one is to have both um, high ambition and flexibility. Maybe that's a good definition. So, so uh, if you aim to revolutionize one of the biggest industries in the world, you, there is always people around you that don't think it's possible. So to to uh, see through that and stick to your vision um, and aim high in everything you do, in partnerships, in marketing, in sales. Um, but the flexibility uh, also, very much so. So um, um, finding the product market fit is not a, a straight line if you look uh, backwards. So uh, you need to build hypotheses, start testing, um, iterate your hypothesis and so on. And, and to do this um, with the physical product requires time, patience, uh, flexibility. Uh, yeah, maybe those two. Yeah, I think that product market fit is something that ob- obviously pops up talking about any company and it seems very, or it's something you have to have in place before you start start scaling. You joined in 2019, right? So yes. eight years uh, after the company and the first lectures had been seen and the company had been been founded. How much of the product market fit work had been done prior to your arrival and and because if you look at the the kind of the time scale or or of what what has happened in the past two years you obviously had a huge set of different announcements you've uh, partnered with adidas and and big other companies you've ipo'd and you're you seem to be on everyone's lips now so what has happened here uh, in the in the last two years or how much rather of that work had already maybe been done in in terms of the product market fit um, work Mm. A lot, of course. Um, let's put it this way. Uh, firstly, this company was founded six years back. Um, a spin-off uh, out of VTT. 
Um, but um, to your question, um, so our innovation is is quite uh, different. So normally in textile industry, you see uh, evolutions, uh, innovation evolutions. So for example, replacing one or several uh, chemicals with less uh, harmful chemicals and, and so on, uh, being able to uh, step by step uh, move towards a more natural uh, dissolving, for example, uh, phase of the textile fiber. Uh, we do things very differently. So uh, we take a technology that has been uh, planned for another industry uh, and we uh, we apply it in, in a new industry. So that uh, level of, of innovation takes a lot of time, a lot of basic research and development. And we have many, many researchers in, in house. Um, and uh, that's why it has taken us so many years, uh, first five or so years before uh, establishing the company and then six years after that. And then once uh, we felt, okay, now our uh, technical setup is optimized enough and our fiber that comes out of the process is, is good enough to, to be offered to the market, then we were, uh, in fact, uh, quite amazed how things, how fast uh, things started to develop. Uh, we believe in product or in uh, customer-led product development. So uh, I think as... Uh, as early as possible, it's good to go go out to the marketplace and try to find the applications or uh, that you can support with your current product uh, offering and optimize those to fit the market needs. Um, yeah, so actually this year we have been I joined in 2019, but this year we were we have been able to push out and, and uh, communicate many of these things that have been done uh, for a longer time. Yeah. Do you think uh, it's a common path, path if you look at other deep tech companies? Is it is, because it seems to be, you know, there's a big innovation. You talked about 10x leaps, uh, something that hasn't been done before. It requires a lot of validation. So is this a characteristic of deep tech companies that you need to have patience, you need to be prepared also to invest a lot of time, maybe in some cases a lot of capital to to then at some point hopefully see the results and then from there maybe be able to scale quite fast? Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the way I see it is that, of course, there is the platform level, uh, the technology stack level uh, development and optimization that that is there a need to, needs to continue. But while that continues, as soon as it is possible, I would uh, start the, uh, the customer-led commercial product development. So try to have an educated guess on what application areas would be, would be good to start with and then find the leading customers who are committed in you and, and in innovation. And uh, then learning yourself what brings value to the customer uh, who can be the pay that the customer that is willing to pay 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 for your product how much and, and all this work and and even things like business model development comes only after yeah has it been hard to to approach these big firms these these companies and and kind of be able to do some pilots try them or or you know for other cco teams or or commercial teams looking to get into possible pilot projects with their deep tech um is there any any good tips on how to approach these quite big companies with these innovations? Mm. Yes, um, I guess there's no magic bullet. So um, it's always a chicken and egg thing. We have we have had the privilege to be, be very picky. So we have quite a um, harsh customer prioritization criteria. Um, the commercial potential and elements of that is of course one one uh, field and then the technical fit that we can support technical fit in. Uh, it's always a function of time, but if you look at, let's say, midterm. And uh, then in, in addition to that, in this pre-commercial phase that we are in today, it's very important to us that the customer is, is committed in us in, in many ways. So they are willing to put money and resources in, in uh, developing products with us. They are willing to take the risk of, of maybe n us not meeting quality or not meeting time demands. 
Yeah, so, so it's a big topic. And I would say the biggest, the customers pay us, but the biggest investment from, from their side might be the allocation of their best people and the uh, testing and development capacity that they have. Uh, so one can be very fortunate to have that. Maybe also to mention that um, what we are very uh, critical about is the, uh, is the shared values um, and, and real commitment in sustainability uh, by the customers. So this is sort of a ticket to play criteria for us. Yeah. Exactly. I'm curious, you mentioned you, you have different potential applications for your technology. You've tried some of them out uh, already. Uh, but there's also a lot of talk about the importance of focusing, not spreading yourself too thinly and, and trying to really focus on the categories that will bring in revenue and, and will work. So how do you prioritize between these categories? Is it through this same process where you, you find the pilot customers, you see what actually works, you see what is potentially viable commercially as well or is there some other criteria also for then choosing the ultimate way to go go forward mm. yes uh, yeah it's a matter of trial and error and also there is luck involved so uh, it's quite fun how we learn uh, customer feedback is is essential we see how our material develops um we we hear customer feedback we see the demo products customers make and uh, then we have some some guesses on and hypothesis on on where to head next and there's of course many sort of fun situations on the uh, on the way where you know we think we have been ready and customer doesn't or vice versa they get excited about something that uh, we don't feel we are ready at yet so Uh, I think a humble attitude and and, uh, and hard work uh, on this side of the table as well as the uh, customer side. Yeah, and uh, yeah, if you think about other companies still trying to extract some of the wisdom you've you've gathered from the past years, what other challenges do you think there might be for deep tech companies struggling to maybe communicate their innovation, get get going, even though. Because it seems like this is a discussion you see in Finland quite a lot, actually. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of really good technology, but we are not that good maybe at commercializing it or getting it out there. Maybe that has changed now in the in the past few years, but no doubt there are still teams probably struggling with this. Mm. Um, are there any, what other, you know, reasons do you think there might be for, for deep tech companies that are not maybe thriving in the way they could be? Mm. Yes. Mm. Well, I have a commercial background, so so uh, for me, it's easy to ask these stupid questions uh, to try to make clear that what is it that we have ready enough? Stupid questions from our technical team as well as the client um, to then identify what we have ready to commercialize today. Um, I think it all comes down to uh, having the hypothesis in place uh, and then validating those. Uh, and uh, it takes it does take courage to really put the customer in the center to ask t- stupid questions also go uh, early uh, to the NGOs or other industry players when you're not ready uh, to then sort of reveal uh, who you are uh, what are your weaknesses what are your strengths to then um, with them you may be able to push push your offering forward quicker yeah Do you have any good stories or examples from the past few years where maybe you've surprised yourself or your team as well with, with uh, you know, um, with with success or with getting getting a partnership that no one thought was possible, or or maybe finding a um, finding a good niche that that you hadn't thought about before that could maybe shine also some light on the CCO role or on the commercial team on on what they do um, in 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 this kind of commercial commercialization path of the of the mm. company we have been very uh, excited about how the customers for example added us how they see us not only in replacing jeans or or cotton t-shirts um or replacing cottons in jeans or or t-shirts or such but but also in high performance materials um so so spinova 
now outside the uh, Adidas collaboration, but but in general, Spinnova might have very good properties in terms terms of uh, thermal insulation or odor management uh, that uh, we don't see today in other waste or uh, wood, so cellulose-based materials. Uh, and and of course, customer being excited about that and, and investing in that in such areas is is. Uh, is uh, very inspiring to us. Yeah, I must ad- admit I haven't actually checked out that. Is your like fabrics? Is, is it available already to buy in like some products uh, that are sold on the market? Or are y- I know you're building your factory next year and you're gonna go, mm. um, you know, scale and, and try to really commercialize the the materials. And and I guess that's mm. the point where we're gonna see it. Hopefully, like on mass in 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 a lot of products, but. Um, Are there like some products that uh, you can already see see these fabrics in, and, and maybe also, does it feel different? Is it like would I know if I went to the store that this is a Spinova Spinova fabric and not something similar or like mm-hmm. that we're used to as as cotton or something like that? Yes, you can buy Spinova. Um, we have had uh, three products in consumer sales, so we have had uh, this backpack and then um, a, a shirt and then um, an underrock. And the anoraks are now in, now in sale um, with Bergans of Norway, an outdoor brand. So so you can just go buy them. Um, would you know how do you recognize Spinova? Um, Spinova is, is uh, very much like a um, like a natural fiber. Um, so it has this uh, natural fiber look, feel, structure, warmth. That, for example, cotton has, or or wool, or linen, um, and that's that's a very nice position to be be in, actually, because um, if uh, if uh, the textile market is X today, it's it's one million one hundred and ten million tons per year. It's gonna be one fifty million tons in twenty thirty. So quite a big growth. And the supply of natural fibers like cotton is not growing. And that is just due to the fact that uh, the land area, the type of land area required for, for cotton farming is not growing. Um, but then the demand of cotton and other natural fibers is growing with double digit numbers. So um, so we are very fortunate to have something that is, is a scarcity in the market today. Yeah, that's a good position to be in. Um, I want to talk a little, a little bit more about the the partnership still and and trying to understand how those were created since they are quite unique still for a very or or a company that is quite early on and you partner with brands like the North Face and HTM and Marimekko to name a few. Um, you may already mention about the criteria you choose the partners with to to be you know, have a, a right value fit and, and to be able to and uh, to invest time and, and also resources and, and stick with you. But still like curious on, on how you approach or how do you like, how some of these partnerships were created, um, like to get some, some, I know there's no magic bullet, but mm. still, still like, that seems like it's something pretty unique to, to, to you, or at least you've been good at communicating it and, and got a, quite a few of those partnerships done in the, in a very short time, it seems. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, thank you. We feel we are very early in communicating our product, but um, um, yes. What our partners many times highlight is that they like the finishness in us, so the extreme honesty, hard work, and honesty. Uh, we are we are not marketeers for them. We are a sort of an honest startup. This is what we have. Uh, we will open our production and our um, our uh, technical components to you. Let's work together. Um, So that and and then uh, then what is very important is that it's not only the technical product that is our product or service, but it's uh, also the we we sometimes say that we our product is the sustainability as a service. So we need to have the sustainability facts, the the product facts, um, the transparency throughout the chain, all the way the raw material in place, so that our customers can then build 
their product level story, their product family level story, company level story, as to the CO, CO2 measures, but, but everything really. And there we see a big role uh, for Spinova in the future. We are now building that. We have a quite an extensive and, and high quality back office operations in place and, and systems allowing this transparency, for example. And that that is a big focus for us for us as well. I think we have an advantage being a sort of new generation player. So this is something that would be very, very difficult for for a um, cotton industry, for example. But we are a technical tech, technology company, so we want to lead in this area too. Yeah, no, for sure. The the product you sell is a very timely timely one and needed one. So so that probably helps. But from my experience, at least when approaching these big, in like international companies, there seems to be, you know, armies of people to to get through to actually find then the teams that make the decisions. So do you have like, how do you structure a sales process or the process of approaching these companies? You can't probably just find one person and then try to get in. Or do you do you need to? Yeah, like, is it just a cold call, emails, or do you meet them at some convention? What is the like nitty gritty approach of actually then getting the the first discussions going, and then also like um, figuring out who is the decision makers mm-hmm. and, and all these quite quite technical sales things that at the end of the day will matter quite a lot to, mm-hmm. to getting through the door. Yes, absolutely, all of that that yeah. you mentioned. So uh, fairs, uh, calls, but we also get a lot of contact in inbound. Um, that makes it a lot easier. Yeah. Um, but it is all about, like you say, uh, identifying the decision-making process at the other end, finding the, the decision makers, like we know in all sales work. So, so that's a that's a big part of our work, understanding that for the early phase where we do joint development. Uh, there it's easier because the um, group of people deciding is is typically one team or or then maybe my, some sponsors on top. Um, but then when you go to commercial scale, it's quite a big uh, audience, quite many uh, units involved, quite many decision makers. Uh, then you have, in addition to innovation teams, you have the business units, you have the sourcing, you have materials, you have... Uh, organizations you have designers and then you have the top management who also wants to have their view and so all of these different stakeholders have different questions uh, we need to serve all of them so it's it's then different in this stage are there some good tips on because there's a lot to talk about having these kind of hidden decision makers in every company that you never see at meetings uh, they are the ones that get forwarded the pitch decks after the meeting and they can have surprisingly much influence on the decision process. But you never, as a salesperson, you don't get to identify them and you, you can't really uh, persuade them that easily since you don't even know who they are. Uh, mm-hmm. Is this something you've seen that, you know, it's looked promising, you, you've you convinced in your mind all the right people, but then you get a no and it seems like there was someone in the backgrounds not wanting it to happen. Mm. Do I see this? No, because it's hidden. Yeah. Uh, does it happen to me? Absolutely. Um, this is something that is difficult to um, impact when you are on the outside. Once you're inside, then then it's different. But uh, but maybe one thing we do try to do is is uh, finding a sponsor, a hero, uh, or, or sponsor who heroes uh, Spinova, who then uh, acts as an internal salesperson. Um, reminds people, sells the topic, uh, brings it to the right persons inside. So that's our approach. Yeah, mole. Yeah, those are always, mole. always yeah, good exactly. to have. Yeah, exactly. What about then if you you mentioned the, the getting the customer feedback, working with the product together with the with the customer early on, trying to to develop it together, and then then getting to to something that everyone is um, satisfied with. How does this process look like and what kind of input do you want from the the customer and do you structure it um, in a more methodical way or is it you know, more sending sample, getting feedbacks, uh, reverting, doing a new version, sending or do you have workshops or, or how, how, what, is the, what is a good way for a deep tech company to structure something like, like that? Mm. All of that. We do all of that. Uh, so 
it's our technical team working together with the client's technical team. Hopefully as one in the credit team. The tighter the team, the better. And one can do, for example, weekly iterations where uh, we develop material, we send it over, uh, the customer tests it out, gives the feedback and we iterate. Uh, and then in textile development, there is also parts that the client can do. And then uh, when there was no corona, one would uh, visit quite often to, to then see. And, and now we are back to traveling, uh, luckily. But it's important also to touch, feel, uh, give advice, learn. So it really is uh, something we do together. Yeah, so quite like a traditional deployment of, of much anything. Um from from IT to you know whole factories or whatever uh, yeah yes yeah I was also curious like uh, I come from a similar background in that sense that I also have a commercial background um, not very scientific no real skills <laughs> so to that to that end in in like mm. hard knowledge um, but yet there seems to be a need also for commercial people in especially like companies like this with with deep tech where you usually have it's science based maybe the people who have come up with the idea don't have a commercial background don't necessarily have the skill sets necessary to commercialize what do you think is a good way for someone for, with a commercial background maybe who's been an entrepreneur is looking to get into entrepreneurship wants to do something with yeah deep tech something with climate tech or whatever um to to find maybe these kinds of people or, mm. or solutions in the first place and then also to maybe pitch themselves because I, I can think personally this is also for me the, this, <laughs> these questions because I'm interested in this but I think there are many people thinking about these matters that they maybe want to do something with with more impact want to go and work for companies that do mm. stuff like this and and maybe not do something more traditional traditionally start up not that there's anything wrong with that but I think I can see at least in, in myself and a lot of people around me that this is kind of becoming now something that people are thinking about. But there seems not like to be any any good ways or any set out ways to, to approach this problem as a commercial person. Mm -hmm. Go apply. We have many positions open just now. Um, maybe as a first thing, so... Uh, I think a uh, no, sort of entrepreneurial background is very good, like like yourself. Um, myself, I founded my first company when I was 21, I think. I didn't fly far, but uh, I think the mindset is, is still there. Uh, I, I founded the company that did fly um, just under 30. And uh, it was a digital uh, about digital advisory, so strategy and transformation. We worked uh, mostly abroad for large companies. Um, so it was a very, very good um, path of learning for me um, to be able to, to get up with my co-founders, to be able to fund a company, scale it, uh, win um, big uh, clients abroad as a small Finnish company, so internationalizing it. And this was, by the way, before we see the internationalization of, let's say, Futurize or Reactor. So we, the only example we had was uh, management events uh, going abroad, uh, quite small, but still. Um, and then uh, building a team, then, then selling the company. So all of this uh, teaches a lot. Um, Yeah, what commercialization is really about is uh, it is a certain skill set. So it does help, of course, to, to have seen the things before or have done the things before. But even more so, it's about uh, asking the right questions and optimizing the right things and, and having uh, having the sort of streetwise attitude to um, engage the right people and, and, and so on. Uh, understanding the technology enough to be in the intersection of, of uh, business and tech. Um, and I must say that in uh, abroad, there is a marketplace for that. So I think around the leading VCs internationally, there is sort of the CEO market. They, they all have 
long lists of candidates for uh, promising companies. So maybe we don't have that in Finland. Yeah, and I, I don't know if we have it because like she seems to be maybe a you know maybe the supply and demand don't quite match I think and this is intuition now so I don't know if this is this is correct or not but there seems to be a need for more discussion between the maybe the more academic side and then the commercial side of things and it would be very fruitful to have more interaction and and if you found something like a deep tech company it seems to be even more important to have a very varying uh skill set in the in the founding team since the product is not maybe we're not a web shop like or something very technical very easy where it's a commercial it's a, it's a product that in mo- most cases you need to have quite specific knowledge to even be able to think about mm. let alone create but then mm. the commercial people will not be able to do that but then maybe the as i said maybe the 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 founding team or the more academic side in some cases at least will not be able to commercialize it and it seems like the discussion is maybe happening now i, I know vtt is doing quite a lot of work around that and there seems to be deep tech funds coming so maybe we're lagging a bit behind but there's mm. there's becoming a, a more supply now but um Yeah, uh, I mm. think that's something that maybe would be needed also to to have more fruitful conversations and and also partnerships between the sectors. Mm. Yeah, that's a good maybe also a pot topic for you. So, what is the skill set needed skill set for a commercial person? Yeah, because of course you need the analytical skill set and you need to have the track being able to approach a problem in a very analytical manner with numbers and with qualitative areas um, to have the right hypothesis in place, backed by data. Um, but then, like I said, I, I, I think it's still more about the ambition and flexibility. Yeah. No, I People think skills. Exactly. Yeah, it seems like that will that'll be very, very important. Maybe to, to part off then um what's next for for spinova the coming coming years um what will happen if everything goes as planned mm. Mm. yes well now we are just uh, stepping into the commercial phase of the company which is very exciting so next year we will have our scale commercial uh quite a small sc- commercial scale up and running and then uh, gradually we increase that the capacity um, there is big things coming up in the sustainability area uh, the product uh, quality uh, is already there for for uh, a big number of applications and that validation work continues uh, and then price is something And business models is, is something that we now have for the next times ahead. And and then uh, we constantly iterate uh, further work with that to, to have it optimal for, for each phase of the company. Um, this all gives a very good foundation for, for building the, the, the optimal partnerships for Spinova, both in the value chain area as well as the, um, the customers. And it's a B2B, B2B2C company. So then together with brand partners, we build the awareness and position amongst the consumers. That's a big task ahead for us. We could not do it alone. Um, but we want to be the, the credible player for the critical audience out there. Um, somebody they can trust, trust in. And then slowly increase the awareness of amongst the, the bigger audience. Sounds exciting. Um gonna follow the follow the journey and, and I hope for the best as well. So best of luck. Thanks for for coming on the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure being part of the part of SOAT. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. See you in the next episode. Remember to subscribe and rate and hate and everything else too. See you. Bye bye.